Red River Shootout takes place at the Cotton Bowl, Texas and Oklahoma, set to do battle this Saturday. We are here previewing, predicting, and breaking down this game between the Longhorns and the Sooners. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Phillips. He's Dave Shoemate. He's Cole Thompson. We're here breaking down the Red River Shootout between Texas and Oklahoma. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn on notifications. Check us out via podcast, wherever you get those. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. This segment brought to you by our friends over at Prize Picks. Go to prizepicks.com. Use promo code SECU at sign up to get your $50 bonus when you play your first $5 or more lineup. Again, guys, that's prizepicks.com. Promo code SECU to get $50 instantly today. For the first time as an SEC battle, the Red River Shootout takes place at the Cotton Bowl in Dallas. Texas and Oklahoma renew one of the best rivalries in all of college football. Sooners, Longhorns doing battle, need I say more. We're here previewing, predicting, and breaking down this game. I am Chris Phillips. I'm joined by my friends Dave Shoemate, Cole Thompson. When you got a game this big and arguably the best rivalry in college football, it calls for a three-man crew, and here we are. Gentlemen, how are we doing today? Doing well, man. Fired up to uh, break this game down. I know we got our fellow Texan over here. Uh, if you're watching people over there to my left, but I'm excited to get this one started, man. I, I, I get it. I talked about it when we were off here. Only thing that bothers me going to this one, needed to stay at 11. Needed to stay at 11. I, I mentioned this, Cole, before I let you go, just to let the people know. It felt appropriate for Cole Thompson to do the lead-in for this game. Because there's nobody on this panel more familiar with what this game means, what the Cotton Bowl means, the hatred, the intensity. There's nobody on this panel more familiar than Mr. Cole Thompson. So Cole, I'll, I'll hand it to you, my friend. I'm just so glad that you called it the Red River Shootout. We don't care what the PC culture is. We don't care what the matchups are put on the big billboard. Those who bleed the crimson and cream, those who bleed the burnt orange and white, know this is the Red River Shootout. This is the Texas State Fair. It's big text waving on you as you're about to watch a bloodbath between what truly is the only environment in college football where for 30 minutes it's a home game and 30 minutes it is a ravenous road atmosphere. It is a close call in vicinity. It is a game of all games. It is a matchup that you have to experience once in your lifetime. If you call yourself a true college football fan, if you call yourself part of this fraternity that we live for on Saturdays, this is the game. It does not matter what the records say. It does not matter what the matchups look like. It does not matter how many five stars take the field in an 11-man front. It doesn't matter who are the coaches. You throw everything out the window when you corral on into the Cotton Bowl atmosphere. You can feel it shaking in the rafters. You can smell the waftingness of corn dogs and Tito's vodka, and you embrace what is one of the greatest game days in all of this industry, in any sport that is whatsoever. I know as an Alabama grad that I will always say the Iron Bowl is the premier rivalry in the SEC, but you're basically putting me in a one-two combination where it's 1A, 1B, because as a native Texan, as somebody who has, em who has embraced this game, as somebody who has been to this atmosphere, there is nothing like a Saturday out in the Lone Star State when these two do battle. I am so pumped, and people are going to realize pretty quickly this is why you brought them to the SEC. You don't give a damn about what happened to the Alabama, Texas, or Oklahoma, LSU. You brought it in to have it. this rivalry on that main stage with that damn logo. That's why you brought this game to the SEC. You brought these two teams in for what is going to be October 12th at 2.30. And to your point, Cole, on this channel, we call it the Red River Shootout. We call it the world's largest outdoor cocktail party. We call it the Civil War, whatever rivalry game you're speaking on. Let's call it what we should. It's the Red River Shootout. Again, this taking place in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl, a 2.30 kick, which, as Dave mentioned, is a little bit different than years past. Drink Typically, your water, ladies and gentlemen. Drink, drink your water. Your water. <laughs> Typically Every sip has of been, alcohol. Mix in a sip of aqua. That's all I'm asking. Typically, Mimosas for water. Yeah, it's been 11 a.m. in years past. Obviously, I don't have to tell Texas or OU fans that, but uh, you got a little bit longer to indulge in the liquids. Just make sure it's 
the right ones, and you make it and to kick off. Or better to yet, talk mad smack, which is even better. Yes, yes. The the shit talk will be at an all time high there at the Texas State here. This game on ABC, guys, at the Cotton Bowl, like I mentioned, guys, Texas is a fourteen and a half point favorite in this football game. The over under is set at forty nine and a half. Series history: Texas leads at all time sixty three fifty one and five. And the last meeting, who can forget last year when Oklahoma beat Texas by a final score of 34 to 30. Guys, that's worth noting, too, because I look at the spread as we dive in the matchup. Oklahoma has owned this series. Like, let's let's be totally transparent. They've owned this series like the last 20 years. They, they've owned the rivalry. Texas gets all the hype and the love and, you know, we got an SEC media days, Nick Saban talking about, hey, Texas isn't going to run the SEC. Like, And Oklahoma fans are screaming from the mountaintops. They didn't run the Big 12. We did. <laughs> and we beat them more often than not. So this is a game I feel like you can't just look at the spread and you can't just look on paper and, and say you think you know what's going to happen. Boys, you don't know what the hell is going to happen down in Dallas. So, as again, we dive into this game the SEC debut of the Red River rivalry. Guys, we've been hearing all offseason long. Is it the best rivalry in the SEC? The Red River shootout, by the way. There we go. I, have, there I know go. I have I have a rivalry tight in the notes. I do apologize, but I have Red River shootout more often than not in my notes. I Forget rivalry. It's the shootout, darn it. It's the it. shootout. Bang, bang. We're going to it's, war. It's the shootout. So, guys, on the field, I think the big storyline in this one, we'll start with Texas. Quinn Ewers is making his return. Arch Manning, obviously, holding it down as QB1. Looked good, looked solid, but this is Quinn Ewers' team. What are we expecting from him, and is there any concern that coming off a couple weeks of not being in action, he could be a little bit rusty? And going up against a really good Oklahoma defense, by the way, we could see some of the effects of that. Or do we expect him to hit the, round, the ground running in this football game? Yeah, I mean, I think there's – I mean, he's been off four weeks, essentially. I know not practice, including, but game action, you factor in a bye week because he's missed what? UTSA, no, ULM, Mississippi State, bye week, and it'll be this week. Yeah, so it'll be four weeks. That matters. And, again, against a Brent Venables defense that has a bye week to get some guys healthy, um, I think people are going to have to watch here, something to watch here. You've heard of, like, pattern matching. It's usually like a Nick Saban, Kirby Smart background where, like, you are playing man, but you're passing off coverages. Brent Venables and them run a pattern reading. So their, their backs are – their eyes are to the quarterback. So they're keeping everything in front of them. As we know, Sark, usually about a 70% pass-to-run ratio guy. He, he likes to really pass to set up the run, if you want to say so. It, it, he wants to take it over the top with the crossing routes. Oklahoma, the, these two teams, this is what I think is the best. Again, Nicole is 100% right. Hit on all the narratives, the rivalry going into this one. Throw out the record books. I think that's overused sometimes in college football because usually the better team in, like, the Iron Bowl. I can't even remember the last time there was a massive upset in it. Almost last year, but not normally. But I, I do remember some – here in the last 10, 12 years than being some underdogs like Matt Brown is last year, even the year got fired, getting upsets in this rivalry. But I'm really fired up for the offensive coordinator chess match, offensive defense coordinator chess match between Sar Steve Sarkeesian and Brent Venable, Zach Alley and them. That'll be so – I think that may be one of the better coordinator matches we have in this entire league here in the near future. I'm excited to see it because I think both these teams know the in and outs of their schemes. Who can limit the mistakes? Quinn Ewers, like you mentioned, uh, Chris, I think he is going to come off a little rusty. Does that mean Texas, he doesn't get it together at some point in the game? No, but four weeks is a lot, and the first team you see may be the best schemer you face all year. I think the big question, though, is, is that what version of Quinn Ewers are we getting in the Red River shootout? Because keep in mind, in 2022, he gets injured against Alabama. His first game back is in this matchup, and it's the best game of 2022 for his career. Four touchdowns, 289 yards, almost a 68% passer rating, 182 complete. I mean, 182 passer rating, 67.8 completion percentage. He also was able to mitigate the flaws defensively, and he was able to find ways to open up the creases and utilize his legs. This was the performance to where he puts on that golden hat, and you say to yourself, Texas. This is a team that you don't want to mess with in the SEC in the future, and you certainly don't want to mess with in the Big 12. And then a week later, he proceeds to have a very underwhelming performance. Two weeks later, against Oklahoma State in a loss where he throws two, three interceptions and completes 38% of his throws. Last year, comes on out, 
has that early interception, finds a way to lead this team back, but the defensive woes at times, Dylan Gabriel's theatrics, Nick Anderson coming up clutch, that eventually pulled away in this matchup and gave Oklahoma the win. So, so what version of Quinn are we going to get in this game? Are we getting the one that has been gung-ho, all about building up for what could be a Heisman caliber worthy season, making Texas the staple of the conference, despite being a team that was a big 12 opponent last year, kind of was a mitigating themselves as an actual SEC foe, the way that they handle business against Alabama, the way they handle business at times against Oklahoma state, the way they looked at times against Washington. They, they felt like more of an SEC program than a big 12 program. What are we going to see from Quinn in this game? Quick, decisive, cohesive passes. Also, are we going to see that new number one receiver step out? Right now, you haven't seen someone kind of break through as the top dog in Austin. You don't really have to, though. That's kind of the beauty of what this offense is. When you have guys like DeAndre Moore, when you have guys like Silas Bolden, Matthew Golden, uh, Isaiah Bond, Ryan Wingo stepping on up for a five-star freshman and meeting all the expectations, Jonte let him cook, burning down the sidelines. If he just catches that football against Mississippi State, the way we're talking about him is in a completely different light. Dave is right. This is going to be a game where it is a chess match between the offensive guru that is Steve Sarkeesian and the defensive wizard that is going to be Brett Venables. But I think it's also really important to realize Zach Alley and Kyle Flood, the the, the co-defensive coordinators, the, the the true callers of the I mean the the non-callers of the plays, but 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 have the title. They're going to have a lot of say on how to scheme up properly. It, it's a 4D chess match in this battle, and it's one that, honestly, on paper, it, it, it's going to live up to the hype. I, I don't ever put paper with this matchup. You can't. But I do think that it will live up to all expectations when Quinn Ewers takes the field and Danny Sutzman is staring him down and going, this is what we signed up for. This is why we're here. And I do think that Quinn will be able to deliver. I also think that we're going to see a version of Oklahoma's defense that we have yet to even come close to reaching in the SEC. And to your point, boys, I, I would ask this question too. With the physicality of Oklahoma's defense, I mean, should Arch Manning not be getting the ready? Because does Quinn make it to the end of the game healthy? I, I, mean, I mean, I think there's a real shot. Both quarterbacks, backup quarterbacks should be ready. I mean, oh, like, 100%. Yeah. You know, Jackson Arnold will get thrown right back in there. And like to your point, CP, I agree. I think Arch Manning needs to be ready too. The other thing that's really important here is that what if Michael Hawkins had just a good game and a good game plan against Tennessee and, and Auburn, and now he goes up against Texas, and this is the game where actually we see the version of Jackson Arnold that was supposed to be advertised because they bench Hawkins and they bring in Arnold. I, I mean – there's so many different scenarios that could go on in this game, and I'm not ruling any of them out, nor should you rule any of them out. Well, guys, Oklahoma is not going to be able to do anything if they're not healthier than they have been. Uh, obviously, coming off the bye week, you could argue there wasn't a team in college football that needed it more than the Sooners. Their last game against Auburn, the injury report looked like a CBS receipt. Uh, I think that's a big question for them. How many of those guys they get back? You're going to need those weapons on the outside, Dion Burks, Nick Anderson. Um, it's just who who is available. That's my question. I at this point, I don't even know who's really ready to go for them. I know Bauer Sharp's gonna play, at least I think, but the health of Oklahoma has got to be a big talking point in this game. And and the injury reports, I think we're gonna be paying really close attention to as we get closer to Saturday. Yeah, I think I saw I was listening to an Oklahoma podcast yesterday. I was coming back from something. Uh they were talking about they think what Deion Burks will probably be questionable coming into it. Again, like you said, Chris, we didn't get a SEC report from them last week. Obviously, they didn't play. And they think uh, Nick Anderson and Andre Anthony will be out still. So, I, I again, I don't think they're going to have as many guys as they probably hope to have back from what I heard. From I mean, it, it'd be hard for them to win this game at full strength is my problem. Like, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's a tall task, man, to ask without your top playmakers. That's well, CP, we were talking about your power rankings off there before we started this. Uh, in, in where you had Oklahoma ranked. And I think they're kind of the team it's tough to rank right now going into this week because, I mean, let's be honest. Again, it was Michael Hawkins' first start. I think they're rolling with the same starting five offensive line they had in Auburn. So it's be the first week they've had the same group and they've had a bye week to mix that in. Like, you just don't know really how to feel about them. You're like, all right, again, they aren't all great on offense. They're banged up. We know they're pretty good on defense. They've had a week off. I feel like a lot's happened in college football since they last played. So you haven't really thought about them a ton. Now you're thinking, you're like, what Oklahoma to Cole's point? What, 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 what kind of version do we get? I mean, he mentioned Quinn Ewers. But here, too, like, who do we get at Oklahoma? And you're really talking about the offense. 
you also have to realize that there was a big time play made by JJ Hester. And so his role, I think is going to have to be expanded in this performance just simply because of that vertical threat that he had for Michael Hawkins against Auburn mm -hmm. down on the plane. So yes, it does worry me. Yes. It's going to be a very big question mark, how this offensive line looks against a very stout and physical front seven that I don't think we're given enough credit to for what we've seen with especially Johnny Nainson bringing on players from Arizona, the transfers that have come on in, the young players such as Colin Simmons living up to expectations. But at the same time, if they're even close to being at full strength, it still becomes a matchup to when you wonder. And I think that you're going to see a lot of these game time decisions where some of these players are going to do everything in their power to make sure that their body is physically right during the week that way they are geared up to play. And it may only be a handful of reps, but those reps could define what happens in this matchup. Oklahoma is such a strange team to kind of talk about, not because of they're bad, but because of we don't know what they are because of how many injuries have stockpiled up and kind of cost them and kind of put them behind the sticks, especially after the game against Tennessee, especially after the Auburn game. And they still yet find a way to win. It's almost like, no, and it's not almost like it. It, it. It's alive and well. And boys, you're going to hear me say this a lot. That Sooner Magic is something that we have got to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I learned the phrase Sooner Magic. Get ready after, to know it, boys. It's coming. Yeah, after Oklahoma. And I, you know, it's funny. I, uh, I asked some Texas folks what Sooner Magic was, and they gave me an answer that I cannot repeat on air, <laughs> or I shouldn't at least. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, I I think if Oklahoma guys is going to be in this football game and have a chance to win it, it, it's their defense is going to have to play otherworldly. I mean, it's I, I just I don't know. I struggle with like I don't know how they're going to move the football. I, I you know I know Texas isn't like world. I think they're good on defense. I don't know that they're world beaters on defense, but I don't know how they're going to be able to move it consistently enough with Michael Hawkins Jr. And guys, they're not exactly thrilled with Seth Luttrell. I saw more fire Seth Luttrell posts on social media during that that Auburn game than I saw anything else. I mean, it, it was for about 90% of that game, they were wishing for a new offensive coordinator. So we talk about the, the chess match and the scheming. Do we believe that Seth Luttrell, even with a bye week, can put together a game plan with either Hawkins or Arnold to give them a shot to win? Because I think everybody believes they have the defense to go out there and give themselves a chance. Can they do enough offensively is the big question. Yeah, I mean, yes, I think you're 100% right. I think you've had an off week. You're probably rolling with Michael Hawkins again, I would assume. You're rolling with him in this game. You've had two weeks to get a game plan to play to his strengths. And if you're not doing that, you're just being a stubborn play caller at that point. If you're just trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, you have to break it down to, hey, Michael, what are you comfortable with? calling here what are the checks you're comfortable with let's play to your strengths man maybe i want to run some rpos but i i don't want to put a that many decisions and stress on a freshman quarterback in a big game like this right mint cole mentioned half of it will be a road game so half of this game he will be playing on the road against a good dc and pk and pete kwatowski i mean I, I you i would assume i'm giving seth the benefit of the doubt here that he's doing that but you're right chris to perception is reality. If they come out here and struggle again and it just looks bad, it's like, dude, what did y'all do during the bye week? Like, yeah, this will be his last chance, I think, to go prove something to the Sooner fans. Even if not, they don't have to win. I think it's just like, give us a chance in this game because our defense is going to give us a chance. So help them out a little bit. I think that's what people kind of want to see and make it look like you got a little creative and innovative in the off week. You had two weeks to get ready for this. I'd like to see something playing to Michael Hawkins' strength. The other thing I think that's really important here is how do you scheme up knowing what you have at your disposal? Because last week, you, you kind of had a good indication throughout whatever little practices were available, regardless of how much you were working out. You have a good indication of what is at your disposal. Who is playing? Who isn't playing? Who's trending upward? Who's trending downward? And so when you get two weeks to game plan, you have to have, I think, two separate styles. One where you're at near full capacity and one, if everything is going back, is piling upstream and you're just basically about ready to go over the waterfall. Like that has to be in your backbone because if you don't have two game plans for this, what you're doing is you're basically saying, we are only planning to be one style of offense. And then you look like Missouri going to play Texas A&M where they think that Marcel Reed is starting and Connor Wigman balls out. Like that's what you're dealing with when it comes to having these type of matchups. The other thing that's going to be really important here is how do you make life comfortable for Michael Hawkins? Whether or not we agree that Michael Hawkins is the long-term answer down at Oklahoma, 
What we can agree on is it does feel like he has earned the right to start. He gives you, I think, the best opportunity, the way he was able to extend plays and make some of the more highlight throws against Auburn were massive in setting up the Sooner Magic victory that led to a pick six. But still, that's what you have to really game plan for is how do you make life comfortable for a freshman in this environment? Because if it's not just playing on the road atmosphere for 30 minutes, it's the Red River shootout. It is a game to where people, and Michael Hawkins, who who has ties and relationships to this program, knows what this game is about. This is not somebody who I think you're going to see kind of push himself out of the radar, or more, or more importantly, you're not going to see him not understand what the magnitude of this matchup is. He gets what this game is about. He understands what this type of actual atmosphere is. But it's a freshman making his first career start in the Red River shootout. You got to make life comfortable for him. Is it to swing passes to the outside to one of your running backs? Is it Bauer Sharp across the middle of the field? Is it J.J. Hester just on vertical passes trying to beat up on one of the cornerbacks for Texas? Whatever it is, life has to be manageable and more importantly, comfortable for a guy like Hawkins to be able to hit his stride. And that's what Seth Luttrell hopefully was trying to game plan for during the bye week. Make life manageable for a young quarterback in this environment. Guys, does it give you any concern as you look at Oklahoma's last game? We're talking about the, you know, this defense. And Cole, you mentioned Texas's weapons earlier. Quinn Ewers is back from injury. They got one of the best offensive lines in the country. They've got guys on the outside like Isaiah Bond and Matthew Golden and Silas Bolden and Ryan Wingo, and the list goes on and on. Guys, Peyton Thorne threw for 338 yards on that defense. I mean, you telling me Quinn Ewers can't go for 350? Like, you, you're telling me Quinn Ewers and that offense can't explode in this game? Like, does that give you any co- – I mean, from what you saw in the – all, like, I just – I look at those numbers and, I mean, you know, I, I don't know. It, it. I'll put it to you this way. College football has been wacky this year. I've struggled with this game because the Red River shootouts unlike anything else. But I think it's more likely Texas wins this game in a blowout than Oklahoma wins it straight up. Like I, I just, I, like the, the again, throw out record books on paper, sooner magic. I hear you, but I'll say you better be that, careful now, Chris. That gives me some concern. Is all I'm saying. It gives it, me some it, concern. It doesn't for me because of Peyton Thorn. Is this one game per year? And he burned it. I mean, don't get me wrong. The way he looked against Georgia was certainly, I think, a major caveat in the game plan. But sometimes you get that one matchup where all the chips are down. People don't believe in you anymore. People think that you're just not the guy. And then you show why you give us the best chance to win. And for the most part, outside of the Kip Lewis interception, there's very few things to argue with with his performance. There weren't any drop balls. A lot of passes were in the breadbasket. And I'm not saying that Quinn can't do that. What I'm saying is, is that you look at a game, everyone gets one. Everyone gets one matchup where you kind of show a little bit of weakness or tiresome or your body is brittle and barren and it's getting ready to kind of explode on itself. That might have been Oklahoma. They played a physical brand of football against Tennessee. They got to travel to the most toxic environment outside of Death Valley in the SEC in Jordan-Hare Stadium. Sometimes you allow a couple of big explosive plays to go against you. I think that there is a middle ground from what we saw early on and also what we saw at Jordan Hare. And that is the version of Oklahoma that can still cause a lot of disruption, put Quinn Ewers in a lot of third and uncomfortable, make this matchup something that I think is going to be still living up to expectations, even though we got to throw everything out the record book. And again, I could be completely wrong. We could also see Oklahoma have a number one defense at the end of the year, and they give up 600 yards this passing attack. To, like, to your, it, to your point, oh, giving Brent Venables two weeks, I will say. Feel pretty good about and they're that. Getting, they got and they get healthier on defense. Yeah, yeah. So, guys. That being said, again, the Red River Shootout in Dallas, Texas. This game always finds a way to deliver. Let's go ahead and dive in our predictions for this one and lock them in. I'll go ahead and start, and then we'll go Dave and we'll go Cole. I'll, Cole, I'll let you uh, close us out in style. I've wrestled with this one. I ain't gonna lie to you, man. College football is wacky this year. It's wh- like when you think you know, you don't. You don't. We use the term ball knowers and non-ball knowers. Nobody's a ball knower this year. Everybody's just guessing on a week-in, week-out basis, it feels like. The 14-and-a-half point spread feels crazy to me. 
in a game like this. It feels I, – I know what the teams are and, like, the dynamic of each. That feels crazy to me. That being said, I could see it happening. I could absolutely see Texas covering in this game. Like, I, I think truly on paper, they're the better football team talking about it. I don't know how Oklahoma's going to move the football. I don't. Consistently. And, again, after what I saw from what Peyton Thorne did to that defense, Quinn Ewers, you know, coming off the, the, the rest or recovering from the injury – Heck, even if it was Arch Manning, I, I think they'll be able to dice them up if they really if they want to. I think they have that potential. But guys, I just I don't see this not being a close game. I I don't. Um, I think Oklahoma's defense is going to have a really inspiring effort. I trust Brent Venables with two weeks to have a great plan. And I think again, like Dave mentioned, we talked earlier, there will be some rust. I think on the side of Quinn Ewers, I think there will be a little bit of rust. So maybe a little bit of a slow start here. And again, Cole mentioned that sooner magic. I had never heard of it before, but from what I know, it's it's kind of one of those things beyond comprehension. It's We talk about the Indian burial ground at Jordan-Hare. We talk about the voodoo in Death Valley. Sooner magic is apparently a thing. It might take some magic for Oklahoma to win this football game. I don't think they're going to have quite enough, but I think this game's going to be a lot closer than people are expecting, and I think it's going to be lower scoring. I think defense is kind of the theme of the day but I think it's a successful return to action for Quinn Ewers. I'm going to go Texas 24, Oklahoma 20. Oh, wow. I think this is a close ball game. I think this is a really close ball game, much closer than folks were expecting, but I do think Texas is going to get their revenge for last year, and I think the Red River shootout delivers in its first time as an SEC contest. It's just so fun to hear that it's an SEC contest. I'm not going to lie. It is. CP, I, I kind of wrestled back and forth, but not who was going to win, and I know you didn't either, but more so if this it was going to be a Texas blowout or was this game going to be close. Um, heading into it, I mean, again, it is one of the more, I mentioned earlier, most fired up to see from a coordinator chess matchup standpoint here. I think something to factor in here, too, from a score standpoint is the special teams battle a little bit with Tim Banks and them. Burt Auburn, they probably got a little bit of the advantage on that. Do we see somebody pull a fake field goal? Do we see an onside kick? Oklahoma trying to steal a possession. That's something Texas probably is making their uh, special teams unit aware of all week. Like, look, man, these guys probably can't score enough. They're going to try to steal some possessions here. So be aware for some onside kick. Be on lookout, stuff like that. That's probably something Jeff Banks is warning uh, his staff, his crew over there that play on special teams for Texas. I'm with you, though, Chris. I just don't know. I think there'll be some new wrinkles with Oklahoma when they possess the football with Michael Hawkins. I just don't think it will be enough. I just don't think it'll be enough this year. And, again, I, I, I still have some question marks with the Texas defense. I think this is probably the last game they're going to face somebody It's not just going to try to come run right at them. I think every other team left on their schedule is going to try to just come run it right at them on the interior. If you go look at their schedule, it's like, yeah, that team will try to run right down their throat, too. That'll be interesting to see if Texas can withhold that week to week. I don't think they face Michigan, but Michigan's not very good this year. It's not your typical Michigan. That's long-term Texas. I think this week, though, again, you have the motivation from last year. College football is crazier than ever, but I think Texas overall is an improved defensive unit. Like, they still need to be tested on the interior, but I just don't think Oklahoma Oklahoma has enough on the offensive line up front. Again, starting their first five-man rotation back-to-back games. Um, I see a couple, I do see a couple turnovers from Michael Hawkins. I don't think they go to Jackson Arnold, but uh, I think Quinn Ewers off to a slow start, but they kind of pull away in the second half. And I think Oklahoma makes a run late, comes down to an onside kick, special teams like I think. I think Texas, though, 28-24. You guys are right. I mean, you guys are 100% right on how this game goes. And I love it. And I love that I get to talk about something that I grew up watching for my entire life on why this has such magnitude in the SEC. And for my money, I know what the narratives are in this game. I know what they are. I always have. But it's something special about Red River. It's something special about the magnitude of what this matchup is. There's something about just knowing that it doesn't matter who's the better team. You're going to watch one of three things happen. Like, like There have been so many great games. 2022, Quinn comes in, balls out, lives up to that number one QB hype. How about the year prior? You're down. You watch as the former number one overall quarterback prospect, Spencer Rattler, is benched for Caleb Williams. That's the comeback of all comebacks. Last year, Dylan Gabriel, you talk about what this game is. You talk about what Texas is supposed to be. They run the SEC. They do right now. 
They've looked the most complete. They don't have the most marquee win, but they look the most complete. They do. That's why I love this game so much. I do, and I'm excited to see the rest of the SEC embrace, truly embrace Sooner Magic. Oklahoma finds a way in the top get this man a 17 14. Michael Hawkins, late touchdown. Boomer Sooner finds a way. Welcome to the SEC. Weird stuff is going on this year. Boomer Sooner. Sooner magic, baby. Sooner. <laughs> Magic sooner, maybe. And listen, I, it was, I knew he was gonna pick Oklahoma. He was the he, he's the worst, he is the worst poker face ever. Me and Chris is the there, and he's like, geez, and like a kid, it just discovered his you know, you know what. I, I gotta be honest, I never know which way Cole is going on anything, so I, I was surprised. Listen, though, the guys, Vandy just beat Bama and Arkansas just beat Tennessee. Like, I you're not, I you're not crazy, Cole. This, welcome to, welcome to the Red River that shootout that. where it's. You know, there, there are games where you say it's a rivalry game and throw out the record books. Then there's this game where expect the unexpected madness will take place and maybe there will be magic in the air on Saturday in Dallas. Guys, that's going to do it all for us. Do you agree with us? Do you disagree? How do you see this thing playing out when the Texas Longhorns and Oklahoma Sooners do battle on Saturday at the Cotton Bowl? Guys, appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in again. Make sure you like, subscribe, turn notifications, check us out via podcast, wherever you get those. You can also find us across all social media platforms as well as our website, secunfiltered.com. For Dave Shoemate and Cole Thompson, I'm Chris Phillips. Appreciate each and every single one of you tuning in, and we will catch you on the other side.